All right, welcome uh, to the Riverwood Conservancy's second ever webinar. Uh, we're going to let uh, participants uh, join in now. Uh, hopefully we'll have uh, everybody on board in a little while. We're just uh, giving another couple of minutes for attendees to make their way in. Thanks so much for joining us today, taking a little bit of time uh, out of your schedule to, uh, to be with us and uh, to hear a little bit more about uh, the river, about Riverwood's uh, wildlife, something that I know a lot of us uh, are missing right now. Uh, luckily, we have uh, Dave Taylor with us uh, to tell us a little bit more about uh, the Riverwood uh, wildlife that uh, so many of us are missing, and of course, uh, answer all of your questions. Uh, of course, I'd like to start off uh, by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Rashid Clark. I'm the Marketing Specialist at the Riverwood Conservancy. Thanks so much again for joining us today. And uh, just a little bit of a plug at the beginning, because we are a charity and we are facing a, a shortfall of funds as a result of uh, COVID-19 and the various events that we've had to cancel. So if you do have the ability to make a donation, of course, we would very much appreciate it. And you can make that donation at the Riverwood Conservancy Uh, I'll introduce Dave now. Uh, Dave Taylor is a wildlife photographer and the author of more than 40 books on wildlife and ecology. And he's produced educational videos and material about wildlife for school curriculums. Uh, Dave has taught science and geography for over 30 years and nature photography and writing for over 25 years and he's currently the Education Program Director for the Riverwood Conservancy. So I'll turn things over to Dave for a wonderful presentation on Riverwood's wildlife. Uh, we'll get to a Q&A after that presentation, and if you do have questions throughout the course of the presentation, please drop them into the Q&A panel, and uh, we'll get to the questions uh, after the presentation and get to as many questions as we can. So Dave, I'll uh, turn it over to you. Thank you, Rashid. Uh, and I want to welcome a guest. My name is Dave Taylor, and for the last uh, 16, 17 years, I've been working at Riverwood as their education program director, and it's been a dream come true for me. Riverwood is far richer in wildlife than I had ever expected, and I've lived in the area for the last four, four years or so. Um, let's define Riverwood first. Riverwood is a park although we don't call it a park, and it runs between 403 and Thorpe and the banks of the Credit River on either side. But when we talk about the wildlife of Riverwood, we have to think about a much bigger area, and I refer to that as the Riverwood ecosystem, or the greater Riverwood ecosystem. So when we're talking wildlife here, we're talking wildlife that's most likely going to be found along the Credit River corridor uh, and in Mississauga between Streetsville to the north and Lake Ontario, and probably including the parks, Arendale, the University of Toronto, Mississauga campus, and other parks along the riverway and also the golf course. The animals that you're seeing behind me are all animals that were once found at Riverwood, and some of them, most of them still are. We have seen 186 species of birds and that's from the last count and it's probably gone up since then. We have a variety of mammals. We have a variety of amphibians, probably half a dozen amphibians, half a dozen to a dozen reptiles, thousands of insects. We have a young lady that does research on our property on insects. I think she's identified over a thousand and I have no idea what any of them really are, but um, there's probably another thousand or two thousand to be discovered. So Riverwood is very rich in wildlife, and I forgot to mention the salmon run. We are known for our salmon run, which happens in the fall. We get a lot of Chinook salmon coming through. Um, there are some Atlantic salmon coming up now, and still a few coho. But what a lot of people don't realize is that there is places in the river where bass spawn, where we have uh, uh, pike, we have uh, bullhead um, fish, we have all sorts of minnows. So Riverwood is really a great wildlife mecca. The fact that you don't see a lot of wildlife every time you go there is perhaps due to a couple of reasons, the time of day you go and how you look for them. We have an excellent program when we get back to normal, led by two really good birders. 
there are people that have taken it seriously and have amassed over 7,000 species of birds in their lives. Imagine, we have 186. They've seen 7,000. 7,000 species means they have traveled the world. And when these gentlemen take our hiking groups out to look at birds, you, if you were to join them, you would see things that you did not realize even existed, let alone lived at Riverwood. And then we have the transient birds. Some of the birds that we have listed, like sandhill cranes, have never, to my knowledge, ever, ever landed at Riverwood. But they've been seen flying over. And then there are birds that we should have here, like bald eagles, that we see occasionally. But with all the salmon running in the river, you'd think there'd be more bald eagles seen on the property, and they just aren't. Our largest mammal, and the largest animal other than maybe the odd person, is the white-tailed deer. We have someplace between 35 and 40 head of deer that use the greater Riverwood ecosystem. Now, let's be clear, you're not going to see ever on Riverwood, I don't think, 40 deer in one herd. What we do see is, at this time of year, maybe up to six or seven deer using the property. And those would invariably be does and fawns. And the fawns would be last year's. And what is happening right now is the deer are spreading out. Our various does have particular areas they like to go and fawn. Some of them like to fawn and drop their new babies in people's backyards. Some like to go down to the golf course south of Dundas. Others like to have them at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. Some will have their births take place at Riverwood and some as far north as Streetsville. So they move around a lot. And they're able to do that because the Credit River is a wildlife corridor. It allows animals to move from Lake Ontario up into the escarpment. And it's really important. That, that trail, that trackway, that path, is what allows animals to come in and go through Riverwood. So we have a lot of migrating birds that pass through. We probably have some animals, like mammals, that come down. Probably beaver is the best example of a mammal that has either come up from Lake Ontario or down from the moraines to the north. The animal that has not made it back to Riverwood, surprisingly, even though it's found in river systems adjacent to the Credit River, is the North American river otter. And we are kind of at a loss to explain why that is. We don't know why they aren't here. Uh, the last sighting was probably 30 years ago, and before that, probably 40 or 50 years ago. And as we go along, if you want to ask questions about other animals that are missing or animals that might um, show up at Riverwood, I'll be happy to try and answer them. I got into Wildlife. I don't ever recall not being fascinated by wildlife. But I, I will be honest with you, I am primarily fascinated with large mammals. I like the big guys, the animals that would have been called in the past game animals, like deer, moose, bear, and further afield, lions, leopards, elephants, things like that. I have found, though, in the last 20, 30 years, I've become more and more interested in the small critters, the mice, the metal voles, the shrews, the fish, and the birds that are around. Birds really have become a passion because they are so diverse and they're so colorful and they're so easy to photograph sometimes and yet so challenging to photograph other times. The bird that's currently on the screen is the bluebird, the eastern bluebird. 
We do not see many of them at Riverwood. They should be making a comeback. And if you walk the property, you will find bluebird boxes, bluebird nesting boxes put up around the property. They um, haven't taken to them. Tree swallows have really liked the nesting boxes and house wrens have taken over quite a few. We hope one day that we will once again see bluebirds here. This one that's behind me now is a house wren. And house wrens adapt very quickly to nesting boxes put in your own uh, backyard. The bird that is behind me now is a barred owl. They do not, for some reason, show up very often west of the Humber River. Nobody seems to know why. But we've had two or three that have appeared on our property. And that's maybe indicative of what's happening at Riverwood. Riverwood is changing. It is always changing. Some species will find the habitat more to their liking. Some species will find the habitat not as good as it once was and they'll move on. So we constantly see this change. Sometimes it's abrupt. For instance, we lost our groundhogs um, about eight or nine years ago when we put in the McEwen Terrace Gardens. Groundhogs, for some strange reason, don't like pavement. They do like gardens, however, but their preferred food is, is plant food, like grass. So they've disappeared. Now, they might have disappeared because we put the gardens in, but they might also have disappeared because coyotes have become resident on the property. And they would certainly not be above eating the odd groundhog or two. We did see a groundhog, I think, last year in the spring, but there were no further sightings of it. So I don't know if we have them on the property or not. So the property is changing and it will continue to change. If you wanna see wildlife on Riverwood, the best thing to do is get up early in the morning and walk just after dawn for the first couple of hours and then maybe in the evening. A lot of the animals are crespular. That means they're active during the hours before and after dawn and dusk. The, um, there are some exceptions to that though. Uh, white-tailed deer will stay out longer if it's a gray, rainy day. So today, which is gray and rainy, you might very well expect to see deer uh, out wandering even at this time of day. Um, but as a general rule, they disappear early in the morning. Songbirds, however, can be active all day. However, if you want to hear them, the best time to hear them call is in the morning and in the afternoon. And you'll also find that the sound of the songbirds is very seasonal. You'll hear a lot of birds singing in the spring. They start when there's still snow on the ground. And then by summertime, they're busy raising families and they're not singing. And in the fall, you hear the occasional bird song, but it's not like the melodies that you would find at this time of year. And one of the things I've noticed about the uh, shutdown that's going on right now is you can hear a lot more bird songs when you go outside, particularly in my neighborhood, probably in yours, you have the Cardinal, it's doing a lot of singing and you'll have Robins singing. And then there'll be the other birds that you might here from time to time. You might also look up if you live along the Credit River Corridor and see large birds soaring over your house and literally soaring, not flapping. These are the turkey vultures. We have a resident pair of turkey vultures that we think live on the, I think it's the Wells Fargo building on their roof. Turkey vultures are ground nesters, but they like to nest on cliffs. They're not a tree nester. So the only place to nest around here are the roofs of tall buildings. Some of you might remember um, the old Red Skeleton show if you were of a certain age, and he used to refer to the two seagulls, Gertrude and Seacliff. Well, we call these two vultures Gertrude and Seacliff. Um, we don't know if they're the same ones. They keep coming back and they show up and then they disappear. 
uh, they are probably a better uh, harbinger of spring than the robins are. These turkey vultures are more seasonal than robins. We have robins that spend their entire winter at Riverwood. We have uh, robins that arrive as migration flocks. So if you were to go to Riverwood last week or this week, you might see a lot of robins on the lawn. Those are probably migrating robins, robins that could migrate as far north as the tundra. That's another 2,000 kilometers. But we also have resident robins. Those are the ones that will nest around your house. And if you watch them, you'll notice that the first nesting, which happens before the trees leave out, usually takes place in sheltered areas under eaves troughs on your house or on a ledge in your house or in pine trees. The second nesting, and they will nest up to four times, the second nesting will happen in trees that are leafed out, more of the typical robin type of thing. Um, but the turkey vultures, they leave in the fall and they come back in the spring. Uh, if you don't have to go very far to see them, if you want to go in the States, a couple of hours drive south of Buffalo and you'll start to see them again, but they generally are not here. Um, I think, Rashid, at this time, how about we take some questions? That sounds good. Okay. Uh, let me uh, just uh, get my uh, panelist uh, view taken out. And uh, as I said, uh, for everyone watching right now, we can uh, uh, take your questions in the Q&A panel and uh, we'll get to uh, as many questions as we can today uh, as we go through uh, the rest of uh, the webinar. And so first of all, we had a few questions come in uh, a little bit ahead of the webinar, mm -hmm. uh, and so we'll get to those ones first. Uh, first one was, uh, where do the animals that live in the forest, like deer or coyotes, go to hide slash sleep during the day, and what type of cover or shelter do they use to stay out of the sight of humans? <clears throat> That's a really good question. So let's start with deer. Deer are going to bury where they rest according to the food they're eating, and the temperature of the day. On a hot, hot summer day, like when it's really hot, deer and moose and even black bear will seek damp areas. Now, we don't have moose or black bear there, let me be clear. But they want to live, go someplace that's shaded and cool and damp. So along the river's edge might be a place where there's some flooding, where there's a seep uh, underneath pine trees, um, some place that's very sheltered and usually away from where people are, so not close to trails. Although they will, if they think they're not seen, they will bed down very close to trails. Coyotes, on the other hand, there's far fewer of them. We probably have in all of the greater Riverwood ecosystem, maybe half a dozen coyotes. Uh, and they could range from uh, square one all the way over to uh, Highway 403 in any direction. Uh, their range could be huge. They are going to find some place that's sheltered, probably hidden away. I've found them lying in very dense bush. I've spooked them. I didn't find them. They came up and ran away. Um, they'll seek a cool place in the summer. They may use an old den. And when they do den up in the spring and the late winter, they will have up to two or three dens and they will move the puppies from one den to another if they need to. So um, there's no fine answer. In the fall, you tend to find the deer nests are resting pretty close to where their food sources are. And their food sources tend to be apple orchards. And there's an apple orchard just north of the property. And we see deer moving up to that uh, area, the Pinchon property, to get the apples when they start to fall. All right, uh, next question, more uh, specifically about coyotes. Uh, so if you could comment on what's known about the local coyotes at Riverwood, uh, where on site are they usually? Uh, when are they usually active? And are any efforts being made to relocate them or is it something that we're uh, just letting happen because it's part of the wilderness in the area? Okay, um, this is a coyote skull and it's not maybe as big as you might think it would be. They're, they're carnivores, so they have the carnassial teeth. 
This is the wolf skull, considerably bigger. And there's a lot of confusion just going on the topic of coyotes as to what we have here. Well, we have what is probably going to be known as the Eastern coyote. It hasn't been given subspecies classification yet, but it's pretty clear that it's evolved. Now, we used to think that coyotes bred with gray wolves, and then we thought they bred with Algonquin wolves, and, and then we thought they might have bred with dogs, and a clear picture is starting to emerge. Coyotes, the coyotes we have are the product of an event that probably happened six or seven hundred years ago, um, which was earlier than we expected, when coyotes moved into an area up around Lake Superior and they bred with the local wolf population. And that local wolf population happened to be a population of what we're now calling Algonquin wolves and the interbred. And then they moved south. And as deer herds moved further north and people cleared the land and they got rid of the wolf, well, the coyotes started to take over and it continued to interbreed. You probably, if you're again of a certain age, remember going on wolf howls in Algonquin Park. The Algonquin wolf is, all, is, is the eastern wolf and it's probably, to be a true Algonquin wolf, you have to be 80% pure Algonquin wolf. But that means there's 20% of this guy, the coyote, in those wolves. And you cannot tell an Algonquin wolf from a large coyote. So you can't go around shooting them thinking you're shooting a coyote and it's not because the Algonquin wolf is protected. So what they basically said is any wolf like animal within a few hundred kilometers of the borders of Algonquin Park is protected. So a lot of those animals are going to be coyotes. Now what we've got down here in Mississauga is that hybrid. It's a bit bigger than the coyotes I would photograph in Yellowstone or out in Arizona. Um, it's more robust. It's still not a big animal. It's not a huge, it's not like people think it is. They tend to imagine it being bigger. Uh, but it's still a sizable animal and it's capable of doing some predation. Uh, we have had them den up within meters of our parking lot at the chapel house. Um, we do, often don't even know they're there. We hear them howling, but again, their area is so huge. Uh, they have puppies now. There's no attempt to remove them because removing them would create a whole new problem for us. They've done studies in Los Angeles and Chicago and other large cities where coyotes are very, very common. And you get kind of like, there's good coyotes and bad coyotes. There are coyotes that know their manners and there are coyotes that don't. And the country coyotes don't know their manners in the city. So what they found is about 60 to 70% of coyotes when they first come into cities get killed by cars. Huge number. That continues to drop as the coyotes live here longer. These coyotes are learning to live with us. And by living with us, they tend to learn to live with us in such a way that they're not going to get us mad at them. And if we got mad at them, we would get rid of them. So, but if we got rid of them, then these other coyotes would come in. Uh, so we struck kind of a balance with coyotes. I don't think we did it intentionally. I don't think anybody said this is what we're gonna do, but it kind of worked out that this is the way it is. These coyotes know how to behave around people. And you know, we've seen this same phenomenon with grizzly bears in Italy. Now you say there are no grizzly bears in Italy. You're wrong. There are brown bears in Italy and there's maybe a couple of hundred who live in, I think, I can't remember the mountain range, but those grizzly bears have learned to live with people. And in only one instant in the last hundred years or so, did one of those bears do any damage to people. And it was a bear that was released from a circus. It wasn't one of these bears that kind of learned how to live with people. And we're seeing the same thing out in Yellowstone now too. So we have coyotes, there's no attempt to remove them. Uh, 
I live about a mile from, or a kilometer and a half from Riverwood. There's been coyotes seen on my street. There's a notion that they eat cats. Well, they certainly will eat cats that come to Riverwood. Um, but the percentage of cat that they found in the, the droppings of the coyotes in Chicago and other cities has been very, very low. But they do eat vegetables. They love vegetables. When I worked at the Britannia School Farm back in the late 80s, early 90s, we had a pumpkin patch. And we were not very good at looking after the pumpkin patch. So we had a lot of pumpkins that weren't edible, weren't sellable, so we just piled them and threw them up. Our coyotes got into them, and for about two weeks, every coyote dropping we found was orange. They do like their vegetables, so there you go. I wouldn't worry too much about coyotes. Uh, we haven't had any very serious incidents with them. There was a coyote that been very close to the, um, our uh, property again, and somebody came walking along with their dog, and the male coyote chased it out, chased it away, or came out and escorted it away. It did the same thing with me. I got too close, and it came out and barked at me. Uh, it saw me as an enemy. Coyotes are killed by wolves. I've seen them do it. So there's a, this enemy sort of thing going on. The bigger wolf preys on the littler, small brush wolf, if you like. And coyotes will prey on foxes and raccoons because they see them as competition. Your dog walking by is potential danger to the puppies, and they, they will take steps. But as far as I know, there's never been any serious incident. Now, they are predators, and they sometimes prove you wrong. So I'll turn it back to you, Rashid, for another question. Thanks, Dave. Um, so uh, we get uh, a lot of questions about uh, deer, uh, one of the more popular animals at uh, Riverwood. So uh, first of all, has there ever been any kind of tracking to know how many deer are actually, you know, calling Riverwood home? And what's the best time of day to see deer at Riverwood? And is there a particular place in Riverwood where people would be able to spot deer a little bit easily? Okay. The University of Toronto, Mississauga, uh, approached me oh, about 18, well, 16, 17 years ago to do a deer study. And we have done, since then, a deer study every year with students of uh, UTM. There's one currently going on now. Um, as part of that deer study, I took on the responsibility of trying to photograph as many of the deer as possible, particularly the bucks. Uh, we know that the number even before we got there, was believed to be 35, 45. It's been pretty consistent. Now that means that every year, the does give birth to fawns, usually two, one of which will fall prey to the coyotes or some other bad luck. But if all those does, and let's say there's 10, 10 female deer that are breeding, that could be 20 more deer to the population. So something has to be taking them out of the population. You might want to go and say, well, let's get rid of the coyotes because they're killing the fawns. But in reality, people here kill most of the deer uh, by their cars. Uh, I've seen it a few times driving at Mississauga Road, both north and south of Riverwood. Um, and often when we hear reports of coyotes feeding on deer, those deer have been hit by cars. Um, so the deer numbers are being controlled naturally by, by coyotes and other predators and disease. They're also being controlled by people. But the dirty little story is, the truth is, the deer numbers are higher than they should be because people are feeding deer. All along the river, people feed deer. It's not legal. It's not something that should be condoned. Although I think you could put an argument forward that, hey, we've taken all the rest of Mississauga and we forced these poor animals into a small area. Maybe we should be doing something to help them. So I'm not concerned about the deer feeding, but the deer are doing better because of the care that people take. I know that people will have deer in their backyard. We did a survey uh, as part of the deer study 
with the University of Toronto and Mississauga, and we asked all the neighbors that bordered on Riverwood, this was about 15 years ago, how they felt about wildlife. And we thought we would get a lot of complaints because the animals were coming and ruining their gardens and things like that. We got 70% of the reports back, which was remarkable. Not one complaint about wildlife. And then you start to think, like, well, if you're going to buy along the Credit River, you're buying there because you like nature and you're going to welcome nature into, the, into your backyard. So it worked out pretty well. Um, the deer herd has stayed stable. I don't have the numbers from this year, uh, mainly because we haven't been able to get out and do as much as we would like to. But I'm sure there's still about 25, 35, 45 head and it fluctuates. The other thing you need to know about our deer is they're isolated. Uh, if you know anything about lions in Africa, you know that the female lion def determines where the pride is. It's not the male. He comes and he does his thing and then after two or three years he's gone. Well, it turns out that with white-tailed deer, it's the does, the females, that define the area. The areas that they fawn in, the areas that they uh, feed in during the year, that's their territory. Our deer are located in the, the space I told you about earlier. What you don't know probably is that there are other herds of deer. There's a herd of deer over at Rattray Marsh, there's a herd of deer up in Meadowvale, and there's a herd of deer over on Etobicoke Creek. Those pretty much constitute all of the deer in Mississauga. And that probably works out to under 200 deer, and they can't join up. Remember I talked about the Credit River being a corridor? Well, we have corridors going north. We don't have any corridors going east and west unless you count the highways. So a deer that lives in Meadowvale can't get over to the deer that live at the airport. The deer that lives in Meadowvale can't get down to our deer and, and mingle with them because Streetsville kind of is a block. The deer in Rattray Marsh can't get over to the Credit River because there's a lot of people in between. So we have these four isolated herds of deer. But what we don't know, and this is what I've been doing with my photography and other people are trying to find, do the bucks make it through? Because bucks are more transient, they're braver, they will move further. So maybe we are getting some motion, but it would be really great if at some point we could solve this whole problem of corridors and let these herds mingle a little bit because it would be healthier in the long run for those things. As to when to see the deer, uh, first thing in the morning, like I said earlier, in the evening. In the spring, I look for areas where you get green up. Green up is when the plants start to come up in green. You saw Doug's presentation last week talking about gardens, but the same sort of things apply in the wild. Warmth and moisture. So along the wetlands, I find the deer mostly in the spring, and then as the rest of the plants come in, they'll start to branch out. So deer are where you find them. Um, they love gardens. So look around our gardens, especially this year. Back to you, Rashid. Okay. Uh, another uh, animal spotting tip, or hoping for some animal spotting tips, uh, specifically for finding owls. Uh, so other than the wood uh, carvings of owls that we have around Riverwood, which are a lot easier to spot, uh, any tips on how to find and uh, spot owls? Go out with our birders. They are the most likely. Uh, I'm pretty sure they were spotting snowy owls down at uh, Saddington Park uh, on the shore of Lake Ontario. Uh, one year, about three or four years ago, we saw a great horned owl. It hung out in some pine trees just off of the uh, large parking lot. The barred owl shows up occasionally, but our owls are notoriously hard to find. And again, they're not going to necessarily nest where people are. So they're picking the more remote parts of the property. Uh, we think we probably have upwards to two, maybe three pair of great horned owls nesting. But you folks, wherever you live, if you've got a forest near you, you've got these tiny little owls called screech owls that are about this big that live in the holes and trees. And they're probably as common in your backyard as they are riverwood. They are very common little owls but you don't see them much because they're nocturnal. They're really good at hiding. So finding an owl, go with our birders. 
take a look around with them. Um, look for snow owls in the winter. They're all over the place, but they're easy to see. And join some of the birding sites, although they, they do not like to tell you where the owls are because they've had a lot of problems of people going and abusing the owls. So many people that's caused traffic jams. There was one owl seen up uh, north of Toronto. Uh, when I went up to see it, there were a lot of cars there. A week later, there was more cars. And then finally, they closed off all the roads. So if you wanted to go see the owl, you had to walk about a kilometer because of traffic. And, uh, you know, when you get an owl that's seen, it does draw people. But you really, the best thing to do is to know people who know people who know owls. So. Yeah, and uh, we hope to have uh, back uh, our birders and our bird watching hikes again when it is uh, safe for us to reopen largely to the public and when uh, all the COVID-19 restrictions are obviously uh, relaxed when it's uh, safe to do so. And I am working on uh, getting, uh, I'm hopeful one of the birders will do a presentation for us, a uh, webinar for us, and I will probably do one on wild bird photography. So. For those people that are dying to learn more about birds, we will try and scratch that itch for you in the next couple of months. Of course, we do have more webinars on the way. and There will be uh, certainly a number of bird-focused ones. Yes. Uh, next uh, question, uh, see if you can figure this one out, Dave. Uh, I saw an animal that looked like a squirrel swimming down the river, then it went ashore and ran away. What might it have been? And I guess that also ties into another question, which is, are there any uh, river otters uh, or mink around Riverway. So uh, kind of a multiple questions uh, hopefully being uh, answered right now. Well, the person already has a pretty good idea what it might have been. It might have been a mink and they can look very dark swimming in the water, especially if they're wet. They're about the same size as a squirrel. But what people don't realize is that squirrels can swim. A black squirrel can swim pretty good if it has to. It doesn't like to, but it can swim. Um, so it might have been a squirrel, but most likely a mink. Uh, if it had been more rat-like, it would have been a muskrat. Those are your two most likely possibilities. We have mink uh, along the entire Credit River. Uh, a good place to look for them is down at Saddington Park. If we just walk the trail there. There's mink that are seen there quite often. I've seen mink along the Credit River. I've seen mink in what used to be our pond and is now going to be restored as our pond. Um, they are all around. And we also have weasels. We have uh, long-tailed weas weasels, very common on the property. You don't see them very often, but they are there. So your choice is probably a mink. Could have been a black squirrel swimming. Um, and as to river otters, like I was saying earlier, we do not know why there are no river otters in Riverwood or in the Credit River. We just, doesn't make sense. Hopefully, as the river gets fresher and better, they'll come back. Okay. And now, uh, of course, because of the COVID-19 restrictions, uh, a lot more people staying indoors. And I think as a result of that, we're seeing more wildlife out in uh, urban neighborhoods. So uh, one question from someone who has seen a lot of red fox in urban neighborhoods uh, lately, particularly during the day. And I guess the bigger concern from this person is, is that anything to be concerned about? The first answer is nothing to be concerned about. Uh, you may recall, I think it was two or three years ago, the city warned everybody that they were doing a, um, a drop of rabies vaccine. And actually one of the bags went up on my neighbor's lawn. Um, this is a vaccine that basically inoculates the animals, particularly raccoons and red foxes. So rabies has not been a problem in red fox for a long time. Doesn't mean there might not be the odd red fox. And when I was started teaching back in the 70s, I would tell my kids, if you saw a red fox active during the day, stay away from it. Nowadays, I would say there's nothing to concern yourself with unless the fox is wobbly or behaving badly. Don't approach, never approach a wild animal. Um, but these red foxes that you're probably seeing are quite healthy. They're out looking around these days. Two reasons. One, they've got pups or kits. They're called kits. And they need food. And the other thing is red foxes tend to go through a stage in their lives 
and it's usually April and kind of into May, where they show their kits off to people. I have no idea why they do this, but I have photographed lots and lots of red fox families, and the mother brings them out and she nurses them in front of me, and they play in front of me. They do all sorts of stuff. I've seen them in Algonquin Park, I've seen it in Toronto, I've seen it in Mississauga. And then you go back to that same den at the end of May, you know the foxes are still in it, but if they see it, they scatter. It's kind of like mom is showing the babies, hey, these are people, this is what they are, you want to avoid them. And then, of course, by July and August, the fox kits scatter and they can run up or move upwards to 150 kilometers from where they were born. And most of them, sadly, get killed in traffic accidents. So not to worry about the fox, it's fine. Email me where you're seeing them. I'd love to see them myself because we don't have foxes at Riverwood because coyotes hate foxes. And the last fox that we know that tried to den here that had its pups killed by coyotes. And then the fox moved its den over to a lumber yard and had another set of babies. And we haven't seen the fox. Well, we've seen them, but they haven't been really well established at Riverwood like they used to be. So. Okay. Uh, we have a next question coming from uh, eight-year-old Asiya, I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, along with uh, Cameron. Uh, so the question from uh, presumably our youngest uh, attendee right now, uh, which location of the trail can I see animals? Uh, so I guess where would uh, be a good spot on the trails for uh, some animal sightings? Find one of our bird feeders. We have a number of bird feeding stations along the trail. Those things will attract all sorts of animals, little birds particularly, uh, two or three species of squirrel. You'll get chipmunks, you'll get red squirrel, you get black squirrel. In the fall, sometimes our deer will come in and feed on the uh, bird food. Um, you'll sometimes get hawks, like red-tailed hawks, and uh, oh, uh, Cooper's hawks coming through to feed on the, the songbirds. So that's my best bet. That's almost a guarantee that you'll see animals there. Cardinals singing, uh, it's really nice. If you, if you have time, <clears throat> go and stand by the river and just watch. The fishermen who will be out in the river catching salmon will see the deer come down for a drink. They'll see the beaver or the mink swim by. But you have to spend some time. You have to just kind of sit there and enjoy it for about an hour. And you'll see some wonderful things, things that you'll tell people about. So guaranteed, the bird feeders, if you're a little more adventuresome, go find a place to sit and quietly watch at the forest edge or at the riverside. You'll see stuff, you'll enjoy it. And uh, another question, for, uh, more about the uh, spikes and trails of native animals. Uh, have you noticed uh, any, you know, large population changes in uh, animals at Riverwood, and is that of any concern to see uh, numbers either go really high or really low? Absolutely. Um, we've lost some species. We had spring peepers 40 years ago. They're gone. When the last gray tree frog was heard in the early 2000s, they've disappeared. Uh, the foxes have disappeared, but that was more of a natural thing. Groundhogs have disappeared. Um, but then we've had other species show up. When we started counting the birds, I think we had a list of about 80 or 90 species that were known to be on the property, and that's doubled. Um, so we, it's constantly changing. The beaver comes, the beaver goes. So we had a beaver lodge that was easily seen by everybody. It got washed away in the floods, the beaver moved someplace else. But it'll come back. Um, muskrat, same thing. Uh, the deer, seasonally, the fall is the best time to see them. That's when they're moving through. Uh, it's the rutting season when they're breeding, they're more active, and uh, the uh, does are, and their last year's fawns are going up to feed in the apple orchards. Um, Canada geese are migrating through. We never see bald eagles or osprey until the fall. Uh, the salmon run is spectacular. You want to get down to see the salmon spawning runs, uh, but if you want to see them jump, there's no place in Riverwood to see them leap. 
So go over to Humber Bay and the old mill. There's a couple parking lots there. Walk up away from the lake. There's a number of dams. Really, really good viewing when there's a good salmon run. The trick is to get there when there's a good salmon run. You can see upwards to five or six fish jump every couple of minutes, but then you can go back the next day and you might not see even five or fish jump in an hour. So wildlife watching uh, really uh, is hit and miss, but we've certainly seen animals disappear. We've seen new animals arrive. The opossum was not in Riverwood until probably the late 70s, early 80s. Brand new species came in from the escarpment. It's been moving up for three and a half million years from uh, South America, finally arrived here. And I've got possums in my backyard every now and again. So things are changing and they will continue to change. And climate change is gonna be a big factor as we get these floods that have come down just this year have changed the nature of the river valley. And some of that stuff means there's brand new places for toads and frogs to breed, brand new, it didn't exist two years ago. But there are places where they could have bred that are totally destroyed because gravel has been washed into them. It washed away the beaver lodges. Um, it's killing the forest and the land is gonna change. It's natural, it's part of the natural process, but we've sped it up through our, our climate change uh, mistakes, like uh, our pollutants and whatnot. The wonderful thing about this COVID-19, and it's not about the only thing that's wonderful about it, is it's giving nature a chance to breathe. They're, they're, the animals are coming out. We've often wondered, how does the noise of the traffic from Burnhamthorpe and the 403 affect breeding? Now, you're a bird and you're singing over here. And if you're the female, you're over here. If you can't hear this guy, you're never going to have a nest. Now, suddenly, the distance that they can hear each other, we think has been expanded. Will we get better nesting? Will we have more nests? We don't know. But it's something that I'm sure someplace there's an isolated birder that's looking into that. I hope so. I'm not sure if that answered the question, but. I think, no, I think it did. I think it did. And uh, we'll go from uh, birds to snakes. Um, what kind of species of snakes might I see at Riverwood? And uh, are any of them poisonous? I was expecting that question. There are no poisonous snakes in Riverwood. None. Not. There is one snake that looks like it could be very dangerous because it kind of looks like what people think a rattlesnake looks like, and it's the northern water snake. And it, I had one as a pet in my classroom. It was literally about that thick. Oh, that thick, yeah. Um, it was a big snake. Gentle, sweet animal, really nice. But if you were to see one and try and pick it up, it would probably try and bite you. And it looks like a rattlesnake, so a lot of people think, oh, this is dangerous. Let's kill it. No, it's a beautiful, wonderful snake, leave it be. The other snake that you will probably more often see is the garter snake, and they're very common. Um, a lot of people will pick them up. If they pick them up, they're going to poop on you because the poop smells bad. I mean, you, ugh, like you, and that's the point of it. You don't want to hold something that stinks. Well, they, they stink, it's their defense mechanism. By the way, turkey vultures do the same thing, except they don't poop on you, they throw up on you. And I've been told by people that have been vomited on by turkey vultures, you only want to do it once, and even then you're not sure you should have done it. But, you know, snakes will poop on you. Um, garter snakes are not dangerous, they're very common. Then we have a small snake that's all kind of brown, it's called the decay snake or little brown snake. Beautiful little snake, and then we have one called a red belly, and it's also harmless. And I think uh, I think Douglas and a few of the gardeners saw a milk snake once. So we do have five or six species of snakes, none of them poisonous. But let me put a caveat on there. We have a, an associate who works at a, a, one of the field centers. She came in one day for a meeting, and her hand was swollen up, and she was snake bitten. We asked her why. What happened? She said it was the pet garter snake that bit her hand. 
Now, garter snakes are not poisonous, but that doesn't mean that you can't have an allergic reaction to their bite. Um, and this particular garter snake was well fed and had a lot of debris in its teeth. And it was that debris in its fangs that got into her bloodstream and caused her uh, about two months of agony. She was really, so if you're gonna handle any animal, I don't suggest you do, handle them with care and never ever take for granted that you won't have some sort of allergic reaction. But there are snakes viewed properly and handled properly are not a problem. Okay, uh, turning a little bit outside of Riverwood, but uh, still in Mississauga, a few years ago, uh, I saw a herd of deer grazing on the field along Old Dairy Road in Meadowvale Village. How common would that be? Oh, that's one of my secrets. <laughs> uh, in the fall, uh, till this year, the farmer would plant crops and the deer would come in and you could see upwards to 20 or 30 deer and the bucks would come in and it's a really good place to look for them. Um, but right now there's nothing there, it's just a dirt field. The deer are still around someplace, but I haven't seen them. I haven't seen very many. I've seen one or two deer uh, the last three months. And I, my daughter lives up that way, so I'm up there quite a bit. And very disappointing, but they're still there. They'll come out in the fall if the farmer plants the right food. Talk to the farmer. <laughs> uh, back for a minute, just uh, to snakes for a moment. Uh, a question, can snakes hear? And if so, do they get startled? Uh, and I think the question is coming from someone who spotted a snake, wanted to call over someone to see the snake, but was concerned that uh, yelling would scare the snake away. So uh, how are snakes when it comes to hearing? Snakes can't hear. They, that's one of the senses they don't have, they don't need. Um, but because, you know, they're on the ground, they can feel vibrations, vibrations that you might sneak up on them and tippy toe, and they would feel that. And they also are really good at sensing chemicals that you release in the air, uh, particularly like a little critter like a mouse goes by, it leaves a scent trail and the forked tongue of the snake goes in and brings that scent into an organ in the top of its mouth called a Jacobson organ. And that organ says, ah, oh, that's a mouse. I'm gonna go this way. And the fresher the taste, you'll see the snake's head looking around, tongues forking out, and it'll decide to go this way because that's the way the mouse went because the scent is stronger and fresher. So they can't hear, um, uh, they won't react, but they will react to vibrations. So that may sometimes mimic hearing, but. Right, we're getting close to, uh, to wrapping up uh, and uh, you know, the end of our uh, oh, presentation here because uh, yeah, right. you know, you, you've been uh, wonderful, Dave, in answering uh, so many questions as they've been coming in. Uh, and we'll wrap it up with, uh, a note to your photography because uh, off the top of the webinar uh, we had a number of uh, Dave's photos uh, playing alongside uh, his presentation so uh, a comment first of all uh, that your photos were beautiful and did you take the majority in Riverwood uh, if so were you mostly out in the very early morning and uh, are these the uh, chance sightings when you're getting those photographs or uh, are you out there looking for something specific? Well I could say I'm really really good at my job and I stalk these animals in buckskin and, and you know, frills. Uh, most of them were taken by chance. Um, not all of them. I would say the coyote particularly, you don't regularly see coyotes there. So the coyote picture driving in, you see him, you take his picture if you have a camera ready. So I tend to go to work with a camera beside me in the car. And when I go walking, I take it with me. I know Derek, um, our conservation specialist, he's got wonderful pictures because he's out far more than I am. The trick, the successful way of doing nature photography is to get out. You won't photograph a moose sitting in your house. So you may drive all the way up to Algonquin Park to see a moose, you may not got, get one, but your chances are better. The chance of seeing wildlife in Riverwood increases with the amount of time you spend there and how you walk. And, um, there's a book by Tom Brown, uh, Nature's Guy, a Guide to Nature Interpretation and whatever. And he talks about how to walk and track and how to look and see things. So one of the things he says is keep your eyes going in a figure eight. So you're looking up and down and around you. Use your ears, walk quietly. Um, 
If you're stalking something, it might take you 10 minutes to go across the length of this room. Those are techniques that I think you start to use as a photographer. But the reality is in Riverwood, because we feed the animals, feed the birds, the chances of you going to Riverwood and getting some good pictures of most of many of our songbirds, especially, are really good. And even some of our hawks, uh, red-tailed hawks can adapt very close to, very quickly to people being in the area and they'll sort of not fly off the way they would if you're out trying to photograph them in the countryside. Our deer are very habituated. If you see a white-tailed deer in Riverwood, as long as you don't approach them, uh, you'll see them. They, they're not going to run away unless there's something else going on. Because they, they're used to people. They're used to dogs. They have to be, or they'd spend their entire lives running around. Uh, one question that you didn't ask that I would like to answer, and that is what's the most dangerous animal in Riverwood? And obviously, you know, bad people would be probably the, the answer. And then people are going to say, well, okay, coyotes. No. More people are going to, by animals are going to be injured by dogs. Dogs off leash are a really big problem. Dogs that are off leash, they get running around, they chase the deer, they disrupt, they, they could be a threat to the coyote puppies, but they are also a threat to people. So when we have classes out, we tell our kids, do not pet a dog. Just let the dog go by, don't go towards the dog, even if the dog is on leash, unless the owner says, you can pet him. You don't pet dogs. Dogs are wonderful. My daughters are going to get puppies shortly. I'm looking forward to it. But the, the rule I would, the most dangerous animal is probably the animal we live with that has become the most habituated to us, and that's a dog. And there are people I know that feed coyotes, and they think that's a wonderful thing. But feeding a coyote habituates that coyote. And the coyote that's habituated and really gets used to being around people and doesn't fear them is the coyote that's going to bite somebody or it's the coyote that's going to get killed by a car. Right. So feeding birds, fine. Feeding deer, I think it's okay. Feeding the other animals, I would draw a line on. I think you've got to be safe. But the most dangerous animal, definitely the dog, unless you count bee stings and wasp stings because they can hurt. So. So in, some, import that happy, you know? some important lessons uh, as we uh, wrap up the webinar for today. Uh, do not feed the coyotes. If you do bring a dog to Riverwood, make sure that you keep him or her on a leash. Uh, and of course, we encourage that uh, from everyone who comes and uh, uses the trails. Uh, so Dave Taylor, thank you so much for a wonderful hour of uh, your presentation, your photos, and uh, taking people's questions. Uh, for everyone who joined in today, thank you so much for being uh, a part of our webinar. Uh, as Dave mentioned, we will have uh, more webinars in the weeks uh, to come uh, so you can stay connected to nature even as we all stay at home. Uh, please keep an eye on our website at theriverwoodconservancy.org for more information on upcoming events. And while you're there, if you have the financial ability, uh, we would very much appreciate a donation to keep webinars like this going, as well to keep all of our environmental conservation work going, even in the midst of uh, COVID-19. So everyone, please uh, continue to stay home, stay safe, and we'll talk to you again soon. And uh, to Dave, thank you again for sharing your time. Dr. Rashid, thank you for coming, enjoy this. Look forward to doing it again. Great. Thanks again, everyone. Have a good day.